Welcome to the Sheriff's Perspective, where we explore the many important services of the Philadelphia Sheriff's Office. Learn more about sheriff sales, court orders, civil enforcement, and much more on the Sheriff's Perspective with your host, Sheriff Rochelle Vallow. Good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome to the Sheriff Perspective. I'm Sheriff Rochelle Bilal out of Philadelphia, and I have some guests for you today. So, welcome, WRD family and friends, and thank WRD for hosting, for having me host this show every third Saturday of the month, basically to bring information to the community and what it is that we do at the Sheriff's Office and how and numbers that you can contact to get any help in dealing with any homes, mortgage foreclosures, tax sales, and all the rest of the things that we do. We have a special guest today because I wanted people to begin to recognize and know about Black sheriffs across this country. Our, our situations are unique. Uh, they are elected officials. And some places you may not think that there should be a black shirt, but it is. And they do work. They work hard. And you know, most of us have to work harder than the average folks, but we make it and we get there and we do what we need to do for the communities that we serve. So today my guests are from the National Black Shirts Association. And, and some people may ask, why y'all need a Black Sheriff's Association? But like I said, our situations are unique. And we need to start focusing on the things that we need to do and the services we need to do in the communities at large. We serve everybody, but we need to focus on what it is that we need to do. And so let me introduce you to the director. And everybody else is going to introduce themselves. But let me first start with the man that came up with the idea to say, we need to do a Black Sheriff's Association. And he went around the country and connected all of us. You're only going to meet a few today, but trust me, you will get to meet all of us around the country. So I'm going to introduce my first guest, Anthony Emerson, Executive Director of the National Black Sheriff's Association. Hey, Anthony, how are you? Good afternoon, Sheriff Bilal. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. I'm home. I ain't in the office today. <laughs> so, I, so, Anthony, tell my guests here in Philadelphia a little bit about yourself. Yes, of course. Thank you so much for allowing me to come onto your platform. My name is Anthony Amerson, and I'm the son of the first Black sheriff elected in the South since Reconstruction in 1966 in Macon County, Alabama. Uh, my father's name was Lucius D. Amerson. And in uh, in 19, well, rather in um, 2022, I got invited to a ceremony in the town or the county where he was a sheriff, and they were erecting a sign uh, with his name on it to commemorate a section of highway after him. And there were a lot of other sheriffs that attended, but at this stage of my life growing up, I didn't really understand the full influence that my father's election had on uh civil rights movement on society and today with the election of over 170 african americans serving as sheriffs across this nation so uh after attending this ceremony i i kind of was I resonated with passion to figure out how could i advance my father's legacy and one thing that he was a champion of was helping the sheriffs so i kind of uh put myself in the position to do some assessments and survey the landscape of law enforcement organizations that were already out there. And I found that the African-American sheriffs did not have a voice. And as you stated before, there are unique problems that we face. Yes, they serve all, but they're unique problems and they need to have solutions that can help them to their problems. So we're here today to uh, talk more about the organization. We have a wonderful history of African-Americans serving as sheriffs. In fact, we are the only organization that can trace our ancestral roots back to 1869 with the election of the first black sheriff in the United States, a gentleman by the name of Walter Moses Burton, Fort Bend County, Texas. Such an influential man. 
got elected to a biracial community, served with distinction, went on to champion education for newly freed slaves and the starting up of Prairie View A&M University in Texas. And since that reconstruction period, there were shares elected throughout that brief period in American history. And then there was basically a 77 year gap between uh, shares and then the election of my father in the beginning of the civil rights movement from there. Thank you, giving you a great history. Is that your father picture behind you up there? Unfortunately, that's me. Oh, that, <laughs> oh look at <laughs> So I'm gonna get the next one. Thank you for that. And we needed the history of black sheriffs across this country. And I thank you and thank your father and yourself for the service that y'all done to America. That's what I say. So I'm gonna go on because I'm kind of partial to the first elected people, especially women. Since I'm being the first woman uh, to be elected here in Philadelphia in 181 years, and I happen to be black, was historic in this city. And as we keep making history, I'm going to go and ask the next person to introduce herself. Sheriff Susan Hudson, who is the first African-American woman to be elected for Orleans Parish in Louisiana. Susan? Uh, thank you so much, Sheriff. Uh, I did a little research about sisters in sitting in the sheriff's position around the country, just trying to see, you know, how many had done that. And I looked for elected officials, so I missed Sheriff Cole Tyndall up in King County. But I got you down now. Um, but I only show eight states so far that have had a sister be in the sitting in a sheriff's seat. So are you the first, Sheriff Bilal, are you the first in all of Pennsylvania as well? The first? No, no, in Philadelphia. Just a Philly, in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Oh, well, they had a black female sheriff in Delaware County. And oh, yeah. in the state of Pennsylvania, I, I, don't, I don't see a black female sheriff in the state of Pennsylvania. Not from the picture yeah. I took at the Pennsylvania Sheriff's Association conference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, it looks like that a lot. Um, I'm the only woman sheriff in Louisiana as well. Uh, there are 64 um, parishes or counties here. And so I was the first when I won in 20, December of 2021, took office in 2022. And boy, like you said, Sheriff, they come at you very differently. It's very different for us. And I look forward to hearing from all the sisters here about that. And, and, uh, and of course, I'm real grateful to our brother because I got to meet him as well and reaching out and doing this work about his father's legacy, which I think is just just simply amazing. So uh, it's been a lot, but, you know, we have to be in these spaces uh, and to make the change that we need to see because the weight of the justice system falls on us so so much. Uh, but very excited. I'm excited for first Black woman president coming up here in the fall. Yes. Amen. We're more than excited today. And thank you for joining us. Appreciate Glad you. Really do. And thank yeah, you. we got work to do. Uh, sisters yeah, in the law enforcement position. So we need to make sure that we help others get here too. So sure. thank you so much. So I'm going to bring sure. up another sister in the law enforcement. Uh, this is Sheriff Patricia Cole Tinsdale, I think Tindale, right. in, in King County Sheriff's Office in Seattle, Washington. Welcome. Tell us about yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Sheriff. I appreciate it and appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel today. Uh, so King County Sheriff, as you said, it's uh, the county that has Seattle in it. Washington State has 39 sheriffs. I'm the first African-American female sheriff in this state. And the uh, we did have an African-American male, not in my county, but I am the first person of color as the King County Sheriff. Uh, to note, as uh, Sheriff Hudson stated, uh, King County now has an appointed sheriff. I am not elected. In 2021, the voters of King County, by charter, voted to change the sheriff from elected to appointed. And I was appointed uh, January 1, 2022. Uh, so, but my issues are the same. I really don't feel there's a lot of difference. I mean, I do report to our county executive, but in terms of autonomy to run this agency as I see fit, I have it. 
Um, today, I'm out with our, our team. They are training for, we call it our rapid deployment force. So I'm sitting in my car at their training. I'm Then I'm able to jump out and, and watch them do this training. We have training uh, cadre up from Los Angeles Police Department, training our folks. We're getting prepared for potential riots um, with the election coming up here. Just We just want to be prepared because we have no idea, as, as you ladies know. We don't know what's going to happen, um, but I will tell you, my agency, uh, if fully staffed, I'm a little under 800 sworn officers, uh, full service law enforcement agency, everything but the jail. Um, and I have another 450 uh, um, professional staff. So we're about 1250 total. And uh, I just it's a privilege to be um, the leader of this agency. And I'm humbled every day to serve it. As well. Wow. Thank you. You are a large uh, sheriff's agency. I'm the largest here in Philadelphia, uh, the largest in the state of Pennsylvania. Philadelphia Sheriff's is the largest. And we have the court, well, we'll get into that, but we don't have the jails either. So you know, sometimes they keep that on their side and we work on our side. But thank you so much and, and welcome. Welcome to the sheriff's perspective. So we're going to get right in before we have to break and announce certain things that's going on in this city. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of y'all for joining. Um, let me start with Anthony, and then I'll ask all of y'all these questions. So being first African-American, just African-American period, head of agencies that you deal with, what challenges do sheriffs face today? Anthony, I'll start with you. That's a great question, Sheriff Bilal. And I'm going to tell you, um, in the last two years, I've been on a grassroots effort to reach out and, and communicate with sheriffs and do a listening tour to hear what their concerns are. And I'm hearing the same things over and over. I'm hearing about uh, the need for more mental health and wellness support for the officers. I'm hearing about difficulties with recruitment. I'm hearing about issues associated with migration, the infringement of different uh, groups into some of the communities in urban and rural America. And I'm also hearing about uh, the challenges for the future and how are we going to address them. It's a lot of things going on with the election and, and politics. How do we prepare ourselves to improve the professionalization of the Office of Shares to make us prepared to deal with our future challenges that we're going to deal with? Okay. All right, so we're going to go to uh, Susan. Uh, what challenges you face in the sheriff's office today? Well, all those same things, you know, we've been, uh, but my main job, I'm, I'm the opposite of y'all. My main job is the jail. So I run the, ja uh, the jail and uh, secure the courts here. So that's the main job. We're doing more patrolling as the local police department has dwindled in numbers and recruiting is a big issue, I think, for a lot of us. And especially uh, me trying to sell being in a jail uh, 12 hours a day with folks uh, has been pretty tough. Um, but that's a big one. And then some of the, I ran as a progressive, but I ran uh, on a platform of trying to deal with mental health as probably like uh, you or those who do run jails, we're the biggest providers of mental health in our city or, or and sometimes I'm one of the largest in the state. And that's, a, and that's not where it should be. Um, and so that's why I ran. I really want to affect this mental health system. But in doing that, I look at my deputies and well as well and see what they go through. And so we've been trying to trying to look at therapies and just, you know, bumping up our EAP, um, having more physical time for them to where they can go to the gym and just, you know, some some physical healing there. And then uh, fighting for them for resources as it's a tough sell sometimes to get more money for law enforcement right now. So really fighting for them um, to, to, to uphold them. Wow, see, I, then you kind of probably know why this organization is so vital because we need to help each other out. And it best is when you got numbers. When you need to deal with people in situations, it's best that you got numbers. Because back in the day, uh, when I was part of the National Black Police Association, because I was police officer for like 27 years, the one thing we were good in having was a national organization. So when somebody tried to come at us crazy, we call in the national. They get on buses. They come and stand with you. And so deal with issues so that our support 
needs to come nationally. Because sometimes your sheriffs and deputies or police are a little scared where they are, but we deal with it. And as strong women, we've always dealt with it. We don't want to start that story, now do we? <laughs> Amen, Sheriff. Thank no, you. No shame on you, Anthony. I'm just letting you know. None at all. <laughs> I'm just glad to be in the graces of you, my dams. <laughs> okay, so let me go to my next question about Sheriff Patricia. Um, what special challenges are you having as being the woman sheriff and an African American in this position? You know, um, I think some of the, the issues that we face as women being in a predominantly male field, um, sometimes I have to ask my team, would you talk to me that way if I were a man? Mm. So I do think sometimes there is a difference in the way that they communicate or um, an example might be that they don't necessarily inform me of something that I feel they should have informed me of. And they're like, well, I don't want to bother you or, you know, so I, I do think there is a difference in the way that men relate. And they're like, oh, no, 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 we, we're, we, we're not treating you differently because we're female. Okay. They might not think <laughs> that, but they're all, you know, it's the boys club. My, until very recently, I'm going to say two weeks ago, my executive leadership team was all men. I had some diversity on that team, Native American, Hispanic, Asian American. However, there were no females, but I was fortunate enough to promote a female to division chief just two weeks ago. So now oh. there's a little more, you know, yes, yes. But the issue is there's not a lot of um, command level females within the agency or even sergeants. So how do you then promote into a chief position when they they aren't reflected in the sergeants, the captains, the majors? So um, getting a more diverse group of people in our agency, and that includes people of color, you know, African-American people from the community. So they represent the community. So then they can be reflected in the higher ranks. I think that is so important. Yes. I'm African-American, but I don't have any other African-Americans in any command level position in my agency. Out of 100 sergeants, I have three African-American sergeants. So I don't have a large pool to, you know, choose from. So divert, getting those um, diverse applicants to apply so that we can have those folks in higher positions to me is super, super important. So that's something that I would share. Um, in terms of being a person of color myself, here in Washington, people are less um, overt, I would say, about um, maybe their feelings. Um, it might be easier if they were direct about it, right? Because then at least, you know, it's when they're trying to be secretive about it, but I feel that um, for the most part, I am treated with respect and dignity and at least nobody's overtly. Um, I will say this, and um, however, the other sheriffs within the state, I am sorry to say that we have a western side of the state and an eastern side. It's like night and day. It's like the eastern side is like Texas. I'm sorry, there's Sheriff Hudson but you're not from Texas. You're from Louisiana. Are you Texas? But I am from Texas, but that's okay. 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 I, I, I have the same experience. Go okay. Ahead. <laughs> so that I think um, folks there, A, there's um, now we have in this state, three of the 39 counties are female, but I'm the only one of color, only sheriff of color in the, in the whole state. So there isn't necessarily um I do feel some animosity from some of our other sheriffs, and I have to wonder, is it because I'm female? Well, no, because there's two others. So what other reason is there? So I feel like it is a, um, Eastern Washington is different than Western Washington. It is less mm. diverse. It is um, more conservative. And so those are some of the issues that I'm facing. Wow. So being um women in this uh, institution or just being 
person of color, I say African American, black, um, because people identify themselves differently in wording, but we're all the same. Um, Same here, we all experience the disrespect and some angles from some people, and then we feel the targeting. And then we feel that people try to make us feel like we're incompetent and we can't do this job. And I know all of us feels that, basically. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So, so I got I got a I got a media outlet this that got unlimited ink that keeps trying to come at me, but I stand with the community and I'm still stand strong because their agenda is not my agenda, and we're gonna keep moving forward. Uh, so I think we got a little bit more time before we go to break. So let me ask y'all, what made you want to be a sheriff? What made you decide to run or point it? What just made you decide to do this job? Anybody take it for Susan? Yeah, I'll jump in. Mine was, uh, you know, I was, I'm a lawyer by trade. Not, I was not, I didn't grow up law enforcement. Uh, I was a defense attorney. I was a prosecutor. Um, I had just seen things in the system, especially living in the South, where that were systemically wrong. And just could not see it right itself, could not see it fix itself. And, and instead, the system, just the criminal justice system just kept um, really just protecting itself. And I, I, I was a police monitor for years. So I uh, monitored the police department here in New Orleans for 11 years before I decided to run. And I decided that I was tired of making recommendations. I want to sit in a seat that makes those decisions. So, and again, my... issue was mental health and wanting to deal with mental health differently. And so um, it was just the right time. It all just came together at the right time to try and impact that. And uh, and because, you know, they'll one of the things that's going on here is they'll build a mental health jail, but will not build a mental health treatment centers where the public can just go see them. So instead, it's all it's always the sheriff's issue. Right. Instead of society dealing with addiction and trauma and all those things. So that's why I ran to really just impact that mental health system. Thank you. Patricia. Uh, so for me, this is a little different. I was the under sheriff and I was happy being the under sheriff. I call it vice principal. It's one that's got the tough, I think the tougher role than the sheriff who's got to do all the discipline. I mean, but I felt that that was a good role, a good uh, support to a strong sheriff. Well, like I said, the voters of the county changed from wanting an elected sheriff to an appointed. And I still was not, I wasn't going to apply. I was going to just stay the under sheriff. And um, then my team was like, no, no, we need you to lead this agency. So it was really the support of the people who were working for me, who asked me, pleaded with me, because I think... um, There was fear of who they would get. They were doing a national search. And um, we knew that many of the candidates were not from the Northwest. They were from the the South or, you know, other agencies. And they were concerned about getting somebody who really was going to use this as a platform for their next promotion, their next, instead of staying. And so I really thought about it, and and actually I had gone to a, I'm part of Major County Sheriffs of America, and I went to a conference there, and I was talking to the sheriff from, um, it's the county that has Detroit in it, and he and his undersheriff were like, you got to do this, you got, you got to, you got to put your name in, because little girls, little black girls need to be able to see somebody that looks like them in the number one role. And it's so important. And, you know, I thought about it and I thought, okay, why not me? And so I came back and I applied and, um, it, you know, there was two other candidates that were finalists from one was from the Atlanta area. Another was from the state of Texas. And, and I was the person who prevailed through that. So I feel I was the right person at the right time, even though my trajectory and my career path was not in law enforcement. I did not work in law enforcement my entire career. I started out in law enforcement and then after five years, went on to do labor relations and work with um, human resources. And then in about little shy of nine years ago, 
by the sitting sheriff, he brought me back because I was doing oversight work, similar to what you were talking about, Sheriff Hudson. And um, that's how I got in front of that sheriff. And he goes, I don't know how or when, but I want you to come. And I was brought in as a civilian division chief. And then uh, through the years became under sheriff. And like I said, then sheriff. And uh, just a fun fact, at 58 years old, when I was appointed as sheriff, I had to go back to the police academy that I had done when I was 26. So uh, it's possible. It's not fun, but I did it. And um, I'm, I'm proud to serve as the, the leader of the state. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I had to do the same thing. Even though being in the police department for 27 years, I had to go back to school. <laughs> and, I, and luckily, up in the sheriff of uh, training, those instructors was very, 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 very good. Anytime they take me, who hadn't looked in that book uh, for almost 30 years, and now you're going to put me in that class, you were very, very good instructor. And I say it to them all the time. You were very, very good instructor. So if they haven't listened to this, I've always told them you are very, very good instructors. Because if you got me through, it was good. So, yeah, we all, if we out of it for a minute and then we got to go back, yeah, that's a task to take. But nobody tell you that until you get in it. Then you'd be like, oh. You got to go get certified. Okay. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> back to the book. So let me uh, ask you. So let me get back to you because I don't want to leave you out of this conversation. So what made you decide to want to be a sheriff and how you operated and, and now doing this as the director of the National Black Sheriff's Association? Actually, I've never been a sheriff. I've been the uh, the son of a sheriff. So, why that's a sheriff. I, Let me. If you the son, you I, was, a son. <laughs> I spent. I don't. My father got elected uh, for twenty years, and there were four year um, in, uh, employment terms for him as sheriff. And I was at every picnic fundraising election. I was at the town hall meetings. I was going with him door to door, shaking hands. I was with him at the uh, campaign meetings. I went through the whole gamut of being in politics. Had my friends in school telling me who they were going to vote for. So I experienced the whole gamut of the office of share from going up into the jail area, speaking to deputies, just spending a lot of time around my father. And it really resonated that sheriffs are selfless people. To be a public servant, you have to be a selfless person. People have no idea the issues you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And it takes a special kind of person to do that job. And that's a very important job because the shares are our first line interventions in the community. They're the people that get to see us up close, the folks that we can inspire and influence. That's what got me motivated about getting this into a national voice because I saw the opportunities to expand the image of how shares are portrayed. And also, as you mentioned before, about wanting to inspire young ladies to go into the office of shares. And by the way, we have over 17 African-American uh, women serving as shares across this nation. And that's out of a total of about 170 African-American shares in whole. So the numbers are growing all over the place for African-American females to excel in law enforcement, in particular in the Office of Sheriff. So I'm excited about preparing this group for the future. And that's what I'm really focused on. That I appreciate. I think everybody, I think African-Americans that want to do this job and applies themselves to do it has a really special reason. And that special reason, as I talk to a lot of African Americans around this country, is making sure people are treated fairly. Because if you grew up like I did in North Philly, the law enforcement did not was not kind to us. And so I used to go around talking to people, and especially young people, that you can't sit on the fence and complain. If you want to make a difference, you can't make a difference from the outside. You got to make a difference from the inside. And then you have to have the courage to make a difference. See, you can't be on the fence when you get inside. Now you worry whether you're going to get back up or somebody's going to say something or somebody's going to write something uh, about you that is not true. 
You got to have courage. This takes courage, and I commend all of y'all for the courage that you stood up and decide to make a decision and to take these positions because it's not easy. It's lonely at the top. It's not, and some people are not friendly, but sticking together, forming this organization gives us the support that we all need across the country. And then we all got different things that we can do to say, look, I got this suggestion. This is what I'm doing over here. Maybe it'll work out there. This is what I'm doing on this side. Maybe it'll help you over here. You know, basically, and McFadden out there, boy, when y'all talk to him, I love that man. <laughs> I, love, I love that man. When he came up with suggestions, I don't, I don't run the prisons. But when he told me what he did there, I said, I sent it to the people in the prisons. I said, y'all need to be doing this. I'm not the one that if I get somebody give me an idea that I hold it. If it's not for me, I pass it on to the people I think is needed. So I think we are we coming up on a break. It's about 3:32. And I'll get into my second half of questioning. Nobody's stopping us, so I guess we'll keep moving. The second, the other thing before they come in and say, y'all gotta go on break. Um Register there and bid is. at the upcoming mortgage sheriff sale on Tuesday, October well 1st, said, Sheriff, held all online that. Boy, they make at bidforassets.com forward slash Philadelphia. Yes, they do. If you have any questions to. or concerns, if they try please to do is, contact is, the Philadelphia you Sheriff's Office, office at 215 people, I'm not there yet. <laughs> or visit our website but I ain't at there. Philly So don't be talking crazy. Do it from a distance. <laughs> Get and, uh, registered and bid at the upcoming yeah. tax sheriff sale on oh. Friday, October 4th. No, you're only Held playing one. Let's bid make sure the next commercial. Com forward slash Philadelphia. If Wonderful. you have any questions or concerns, please contact the Philadelphia Sheriff's Office at 215-666-3560. Yeah, that's the way to go. Welcome back to the Sheriff Perspective. I'm Rochelle Blau, your host for the Philadelphia Sheriff Perspective. Today is your unique conversation with the Black National Black Sheriff's Association. And I have a few of my friends that are on here basically to talk about Black sheriffs around the country, their challenges, and working together nationally. Because uh, this is a newly formed organization, and I'm kind of glad it has. I've been thinking about it, talking to McFadden about it. And finally, Anthony took the rim and started moving us forward. And I am so appreciative of you so much. So I'm gonna ask some, oh, anybody wanna give us a call in to ask our sheriffs around the country some questions, please feel free. You can give us a call at 215-634-8065. Eight zero six five. You know, I have a whole lot of questions. I'm probably not even going to get to all of them. So let me go into how did you change people's perspective for them to realize you were the leader that was needed to upgrade your office? And I'll start with Patricia. Chair sure, Patricia. Thank you for that question. You know, um, so prior to the sheriff, we had an election every four years, mm -hmm. and that's what most states and most counties have. So our staff have been a new sheriff come, right, change. And, and I've heard people say, that's fine. I'll be here long after the sheriff is gone, right? Mm -hmm. And. Um, so it was important to me that I didn't come in and make wholesale changes and just, you know, upset everybody. What I have really strived to do is I, I attend events like I'm at today, like I was, my name is training. There's about people out here. I'm out here. I go, I work, I call them ride-alongs, shift, I say anybody willing to have me in their car sign up with my assistant 
and I will come in and I will work not a full shift, but say a half a shift. They love it. So I am always out or visible. So I was quite impressed when the previous administration where that sheriff, yes, I worked in person and was and stayed in the office all the time. It's really important the sheriff and be seen meet with them. They they it's just so it's changed the culture in our organization. Me they're doing seeing what they're show me what you do. I want to be part of it. Um also though I set some very specific um I would say goals and what you know laying down what my philosophy is that I want us to be policing with compassion, treating people with respect and dignity. I don't care who they are. Treat them like they're your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, right? Being thoughtful. Um, also though, that I want us to hold people accountable, but also hold ourselves accountable. So when we talk about accountability later, I mean, I think that is so important in this profession that we don't behave as though we are above the law. I mean, unfortunately, I've had some deputies get into some situations with the law and I'm holding them accountable, right? There's, they're, they're going to have to be held accountable, just like we hold people in the public accountable when they break the law. So um, for me, it is doing what I say I'm going to do and having high integrity. And I just see, I mean, I tell people all the time, treat people the way you want to be treated and the way you want your family to be, to be treated. And I'm seeing the change in the organization. We still have a long way to go, but things are so much better than they were when I took over. So I feel like, you know, baby steps, but it's, it's moving in the right direction. Thank you for that. And so I'll go over to Susan. Yeah, you know, I, uh, during the campaign, and you probably had uh, some, you know, similar experience, uh, the employees really gravitated to try and get, you know, get to my attention, let me know what was going on. Um, and similar to what you said, Sheriff Cole Tindall, it was a different style because I beat a 17-year incumbent who who had done things his way, took care of his folks, but didn't really take care of those who do the work. And we've really fought um, to get them raises. Every year I've been here, and I've gotten them a little bit of a raise, but they need more. But also just looking at what they go through, recognizing their secondary trauma or sometimes for first uh, trauma where they're involved in fights or, you know, some type of use of force. Like the first week I was in office, there was an officer involved shooting, somebody working secondary employment and went and talked to her and we're like, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to send you to the police psychologist. You know, you get, we just got to make sure you're okay. It's not punishment, that kind of thing. And she was like, wow, nobody's ever done that in this, in this department before. I was a, a bystander in another shooting and, you know, it kind of messed me up a little bit, but I never got anything. For, and there was no any type of uh, treatment or anything of that nature. So when I started in the campaign, I went, I ran on three fronts, as the uh, sheriff said, treating people humanely, even if they're in our custody. And I don't care what they've been charged with, because if we do that the right way, they will treat our deputies right. And so that's where we're really working on. Uh, and that was a tough sell to some deputies because they're like, oh, you love them more than us. It's like, no, I love y'all. I love everyone this, uh, equally, but I'm going to do everything I can for our deputies. And so don't ever think that they're left out of it. But a big part of my campaign was treating them better. And I think that was a, a, a one of the reasons I was able to win because uh, they're a big part of the equation. Can't do anything. Deputies are the backbone, as you all know. Thank you very much. I think we got a little a call on the phone. I'll take that call before I get into the other question, and I'll get to you, Anthony. Uh, Rebecca from South Philly is on the line. Welcome to the Sheriff Perspective on WURD, Rebecca. How can we help you? Hi. I, I just want to say I'm just in awe of all you women um, and Anthony, you know, for joining this program. I actually didn't know this uh, really existed. But I just wanted to say, you know, I'm just so inspired um, by you all, especially with our first um, vice president, thought to be president, 
our first uh, black woman to do so, and it's just really inspiring. Um, I just think I have one question. Uh, I know community service is at, like, kind of what you all were talking about, like getting your deputies engaged. So how do you, like, keep the momentum really high and doing, like, team building inside of your offices to make sure they all stay engaged and purposeful as they serve their communities with their duties? And that question you know, is open. So it's thank you, question. Rebecca. You know, that was going to be my next question to the, to the panel that's sitting here. But she... And thank you for being inspired. And I think that's probably one of the main things that we want to make happen to ensure that it keeps happening. So anybody want to jump in as to uh, her question? How do you keep the momentum going? How do you keep people inspired? And how do you keep, you know, work moving forward? Because, you know, people keep trying to take us backwards. I don't Always. Even y'all to jump in. <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, I went to a, a leadership um, class and one of the leaders got up there and said, look, as the sheriff, because I still I want to make sure we're mission driven and that we're taking care of business. Um, and but, you know, as the sheriff, you don't actually do the work, but you just make sure it's getting done right. So I've been really focused on that. But I feel like we got our leaders in place, which took a while for me to get the right leaders in place. And now it's time for me to just drive the mission, get our get our deputies excited about what we're trying to go, what we're trying to do for our community. And and that will give them a, just another sense of instead of this is a check, we're trying to do something else. We're trying to do something special that really resonated with me. And that's what I've been working on now. I want them to know that we can affect mental health in the city if we do what we're supposed to do, if we um, advocate for the changes we're trying to see, try and get people in our custody to a better place. Um, and so that's really, I, I've seen, uh, and I've also allowed them to patrol more, which they also love protecting their city. So trying to find what drives them and um, what can they take into their heart and really uh, try and inspire them. Patricia? So, you know, motivating people uh, can be a challenge, right? Because um, I would say, you know, we work, most of us for money, right? We don't work for free. If it was free, some people say, oh, I'd still do it if it was free. But but it needs to be more than that. It needs to be more than a paycheck, like Sheriff Hudson said. Um, so what we try to do is, well, certainly me and my leadership team try to model the behaviors that we want. Um, you know, negative talk, I mean, that is so easy for people to do. But instead of uh, focusing on that, trying to turn things around into positivity, providing training. I mean, budget dollars are an issue, but wherever we can provide training and advan advancement for people. Today, this cadre that's here is training. They're here from Los Angeles Police Department. I, I don't know. I think it was $40,000 for this training, but well worth it. It's something we needed. Earlier this week, we had 35 potential sergeants going through training that was you know an x number of dollars but having training um, opportunities for people opportunities for advancement um, focusing people on what's your why why did you decide to do this work it is about service i'm a lifetime public servant both my parents were public servants and that it is a noble passion so when we meet with people who potentially want to do this work, talking about there, this is important work, um, serving our communities. And so all this repeating that message with our staff, but I think it, it has to do with that we're walking the talk. We just aren't saying we're walking the talk. And you know, those are one of the things, and thank you, Rebecca, I hope you got your answer. And uh, if you look at, we are all hiring to be sheriffs in these cities and counties. So if you're out there, make sure you come by. Because I'll give Anthony the last word on the recruitment part of this, of the National Association, National Black Sheriffs Association. One of my things is, part of my tenure was, I really believe in community outreach. Events and resources have been a cornerstone of our administration. 
Is that something particularly interested under your leadership? Because let me, what we do here is when I uh, got elected, I've always been in the community. I just didn't get this job and decide my output being as part of the Guardian Civic League, which was a, a civic, Black police civic organization here in Philadelphia that was a part of the National Black Association and now part of the National Association of Black Law Enforcement Officers. And so I was always out in the community, but what I saw in the sheriff's department that it was very little. Uh, they didn't, uh, the administration at the time did not allow the command structure to be trained enough. Uh, uh, they did not allow the administration to work together to basically set their own path and come up with ideas on how to help run the department. They didn't include anybody but them. It's like there was the top echelon that was totally disconnected from everybody else. And so that change came in and then started putting everybody out in the community. Community events, your know, community uh, food giveaways. When the pandemic was, we came up with our own food giveaway. And so is community outreach a part of what you're doing in your cities and counties and parishes? Susan? Yeah, you know, uh, if you've ever been to New Orleans, it is a city of festivals. And my God, I've been to 70 events. I have seven events today. Um, I'm in the East part at the, what's called the New Orleans East Festival. I don't know if you can hear the music thumping in the background, but uh, it is you know, a lot of festivals, a lot of culture, the culture here. And just, uh, you know, I go to as much as I can. And one sheriff told, said this at, a, uh, you know, the Sheriff's Institute when after I got into office that we go to, he said, now look, you can concentrate on the work and you can do all, you do all that and all that. It ain't going to do you a bit of good. Make sure you go out and meet the people where they're at and talk to them, meet them, hear what they want uh, to tell you. Um, and make sure you, you greet everyone you see. And, uh, and I do that as much as I possibly can, but it's also just fun. You know, that's the fun part of the job, hugging and kissing folks, uh, as opposed to, you know, dealing with the jail. <laughs> so I, I try to do as much as I can. If that's what I do, I get out there because people want to see and touch you. And so I get out there and I dance, I'm doing the line dance. They're talking about the sheriff thing. The sheriff is human. I'm going to get out here and do the line dance because I like the line dance. I'm going to get out here and hug and talk to what you got to eat. Because when I pull up, if you ain't got no food, you got a problem. What the? <laughs> so, and so being out in the community is a thriving event. They know who you are as a person and you're not just a pitcher and you're not somebody that's like the, the, the mean person that the sheriff. But when I came in, the only thing they knew about the sheriff in this city is negative that they come to your house and throw you out and they grab up a bunch of men and call them deadbeat dads. And that's all they knew. And so it was coming from this administration to get out and let everybody know exactly what my job is. And so, yeah, <laughs> go, go to you, Patricia, community. What are yeah. you doing? Well, I'm out there all the time, too. I mean, sometimes, I mean, the sheriff is human, but the sheriff needs a minute to rest, too, mm -hmm. right? Um, and what I have found here is, you know, I would like um, sometimes to send somebody for my team, but the truth is they want me, right? They want to see the sheriff. And so I do prioritize and make that important on my calendar to get to as many community events as I can. Susan or Sheriff Hudson, I would say, I feel sorry for myself, but I don't have seven events today. So kudos to you that you're going to go to all seven. But you said some, something, Sheriff Belisle, that it's lonely at the top. And I always say, heavy is the head that wears the crown. It is sometimes very lonely in this position, but getting out amongst the people just washes all that away. It just makes it, it's like, this is why I'm here. It's and, and I love it. I'll get out there and people say, I voted for you. And I'm thinking, no, you didn't because I didn't run for office, but it's OK. You, you know, I mean, but they are so happy that I took the time to come out to their event. I dance too, Sheriff Belisle. So, um, you know, just it, it, it is important. It what's it's I think it's the fun part 
even though sometimes it is a little much because, you know, with working all week and then at the night events, the weekend events, but I, I knew this is what I signed up for. So I do make it a priority to get out. Let me ask you one more question. I'm giving Anthony because he's going to get on the real recruitment job after this. We haven't forgot about you, Anthony. But you got the women on, so this is a real good conversation. <laughs> do you do you get people who I see in Philadelphia? I I got I get the hater gate because they don't want me out there in the community. They don't want people to see what the sheriff's office does. For decades, it was the most quietest conversation ever. Uh, Nobody knew what the sheriff did, and they didn't even know we had a sheriff in here. And so um, you get the hater game that's out there. Why is she out in the community? Why is she giving food away? Why are they at this meeting? And I'm like, why, why, why? That's the hater game. And so you have to deal with it. Do y'all get that little backlash from the hater groups? That's a couple of sentences. Yay, nay, and throw it away. Susan. You know, you know, you do have the haters and I'm I'm up for a re-election next year and they're getting their little teams together and whatnot. Uh, but it's expected here that you show up. If you are a public uh, and elected official, you show up at these events uh, because that's where then people feel like you're for the people. Um, so a little bit of hater right now, if I'm using resources, putting resources out there, then they might be a little and to be quite frank, they might be a little hater, a little hater rate if I'm putting it in black communities and I'm putting uh, resources there. That causes some hater aid. So I just uh, I ain't stopping it. That thing's been wrong for a long time. And uh, I stopped all, stopped all these million dollar contracts and whatnot. It's going to go to mom and pops and people Ooh. that look like us, they're going to get this business. And uh, that's what it's going to be. But that's a lot of hater rate behind that more. Yeah, I, you know what? I get a lot of haterade because of that. It, because when I came in, I took more than five million dollars from a certain uh, media paper, and they've been hating ever since. Mm -hmm. To this day, they don't put nothing good about what my office does. But it doesn't matter because you got to spread the wealth around. And because they were ridiculous, uh, they don't get that anymore, and so they hate. It. But that's okay because it got spread around. The other papers in the city, and they're all doing good. So yeah, thank Amen. you, Tisha. You get hater aid too. Uh, you know, I get it for a little different reason. So uh, in the beginning, when I first took over as sheriff, people were like, "She can't be the sheriff. She's never kicked in a door." And I was like, "Well, I'm not sure that's a qualification to run a police agency kicking in a door." But okay. Okay. Um, so I, um, it doesn't bother me anymore, but I was like, you know, I didn't make myself the sheriff. I was appointed and the county executive and, you know, my career path brought me to this. And, and like I said earlier, I do believe I'm the right person at the right time. So the hater raid had to do with, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't a deputy my entire life. And, and so somehow there was people feeling, well, you know, is that really the right person to lead this agency? In terms of me getting out in the community, no, I don't get any um, negative about that. Um, you know, it might be sometimes on decisions I make, but we all face that, right? People don't like, maybe I had a disciplinary decision I had to make. I had to let somebody go and people are like, well, why did you do that? And, and you know, second guessing some of the decisions I make or in terms of budget decisions, right? Positions I might need to fill versus not fill. So there's people always casting shade, throwing shade. And it, and as you ladies know, and anybody in this type of role, you have to have some super thick skin because otherwise you'd be going home crying every night, right? So you just have to just say, I am doing what I believe is correct and is the right thing to do. And I know not everybody's going to agree with me. So the haterade, the hate comes sometimes with this type of role, but um, that's what I'd have to say about that. All right, George. I mean, I'm calling you. Well, oh, George was the person that was on the phone. All right, so we're going to. Oh, Al's on the phone. All right, Al, I've got to give you 30 seconds. I got to give my people a chance to close out. Al, welcome to the Sheriff's Perspective. 
W U R D, how can we assist you? Uh, I'll get you back because yeah. my question must walk in 30 seconds. Go ahead. I, I, Go ahead. I'll, I'll listen. I'll listen up another time. I didn't hear you. Okay. All right. So, uh, Anthony, tell the people of WRD and here in Philadelphia. How to get involved, how to get in contact with the National Black Sheriffs Association, just how, just become a part of us. Great question. Uh, all of the ladies that are on this panel today are members of the National Black Sheriffs Association, so those are points of contact. We're scaling up this, this organization so they can meet the demands of the bylaws and constitution on a national level. So as we're scaling up, we're kind of getting things in place, our website and things of that sort. We expect to really have a uh, release a national press release shortly that will give all the details about how to reach us and how to stay connected. Well, ladies, I want to thank all of y'all and Anthony for coming on to the Sheriff Perspective in Philadelphia. We didn't get to all the questions, so we're going to have to do a part two. It might be a lot more people on here. And so I want to give out to the community our upcoming event is about to happen. Our community event, the Philadelphia Sheriff's Office is hosting our annual free food giveaway on Saturday, September the 28th, beginning at 11 a.m. until supplies last on 5200 Pine Street, Philadelphia, PA. And we're in partnership with a harm. A house is not a home. Fifth event, this event has, has entertainment, food, resources, all type of event, working with the Councilwoman Gaudier. We're going to be there on the 28th, 52nd Street, 52nd and Pine. Starts at 11 a.m. I need to see all of y'all out there because we're coming. And thank you for listening to WURD 900 a.m. And thank the National Black Shirts Association. Give them a clap for being here today with us. And y'all stay safe. God bless. Yeah.